Good morning to Fresno and a beautiful Saturday morning at 9 o'clock to all of you listening out there in Radio Land. This is Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. For those of you listening on Power Talk, yes, this show is now airing at 9 o'clock a.m. every Saturday morning, 9 to 10 a.m. every Saturday morning right here on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. We are Right to Life Radio. I am the host of Right to Life Radio. My name is Mr. John Girardi. I am the executive director. I don't know why I added in a Mr. to my name unnecessarily. <laughs> my name is just John Girardi, not Mr. John. I, uh, that Mr.'s on your birth certificate, isn't it? Uh, I guess, Well, I guess. No, I don't think they put Mr. or Miss on your birth certificate. Anyway, my name is John Girardi. I'm the host of this show. I'm the executive director of Right to Life of Central California. And you can find out more about Right to Life of Central California by going to rtlcc.org. The voice you hear providing chirpy peanut gallery commentary <laughs> is my good buddy, the CEO of California Family Council, Mr. Jonathan Keller. Hello. And I just wanted to say my name is Mr. Jonathan Keller. My preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Oh, uh, thank you. There you go. I'm, yeah. I'm big on G and Zer. You know, and I, I figure if the Democratic candidates your are doing holiness. it, you know, they, yeah. they, they've updated their Twitter profiles, Facebook profiles with preferred pronouns. Are they so. really starting to do that? Oh, with, yeah. With the Jim and Zer oh, and uh, all that no, stuff? No, 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 because oh. all of them are, you know, boring cisgender males and females. Yeah, that's so. true. Although Julian Castro <laughs> does want to pay for transgender former females, now males, yep. who get pregnant, for them to have abortions. That's right. So that's all, always good to know. He's Did you know Julian Castro has a twin, an identical oh, twin yes. brother I did. who grew a beard just oh, so no. that people would not confuse the two of them? I, I did not know that he grew a beard. But no, John, this was the great thing of the 2012 debate was that, uh, or the 2012 campaign, was that a lot of people were, were joking. Um, they have... Uh, they have doubled for each other when one of them was not able to make it to a certain political event. The other one would show up in his stead. Oh, They've man, done, a little, little, oh, little yeah. six. Uh, what was that movie? Uh, 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 not Sixth Incept Sense? Uh, no, not Incep uh, not Inception. Uh, the Prestige. The uh, Prestige. Yes, there yes. you go. Hey, no spoilers, though, John. Yeah, no case, spoilers. In case you haven't seen a movie that was literally, released in 2005. Just, okay, John, since you brought up The Prestige, I just have to say one thing, because I, mm -hmm. I have a very special connection to that movie. If anyone has seen that movie... You were the star of The Prestige? Shh. Oh, okay. That's I do love Hugh Jackman, but no. Okay. Um, no, I, I thought that that movie looked like a cool movie. I mean, it's uh -huh. a Christopher Nolan movie. Yeah. Turns out it's kind of a depressing movie. Super duper. S kind of dark and like yeah. really Oof. not a good movie to take your girlfriend to the night you're planning to propose. Oh, you, <laughs> you proposed to Julia? I proposed to Julia. After seeing The Prestige? Immediately after seeing well, that movie. Well, because there's a big like marital fidelity <laughs> yeah, question that takes place in that. Yeah. Critical to the plot. I, um, I, I, um, I may or may not have actually taken g gone out. It was my wife's birthday, and we uh, we went to dinner, and then we saw that movie with my wife and my mother, my future mother-in-law and future father-in-law. Wow. And all that time, I had the engagement ring in my uh jeans you know watch pocket uh-huh and i was planning to pop the question and i i did eventually later but let me tell you it was a uh, it was a hard yeah. turn to yeah, get well, from the ending of the prestige well, to the yeah. hey baby as long as, as, as did she as as you proposed did she immediately ask you you don't have a twin brother right no <laughs> it's it's even worse than that john it's even worse anyway okay <sighs> so with that, this is the kind of witty banter. This is a show about uh, abortion policy, That's by the right. way. That's <laughs> right. And somehow, this is, for those of you listening to us for the first time here on Power Talk at 9 a.m., uh, the point of this show is to talk about the issues surrounding the right to life, so abortion policy, uh, physician-assisted suicide, embryo-destructive stem cell research. These topics are downers. We manage to make them entertaining and fun that is that is the goal of this show is to talk about these things to give you political insight get you jazzed up get you fired up get you educated help you learn something and have a good time doing it and so and the, the, the most fun you can possibly have while discussing abortion backfill any uh holes in your christopher nolan movie catalog as well and, and i mean that's that. that's a stated value of yes. the show we'll also probably have a great detailed analysis of notre dame football uh, and yes. um, Top Gun. Coming it's up soon. Top Gun movie comes out. All right. So let's get to the, the bottom of this. Um, well, 
by the bottom of this, I guess let's get into <laughs> the actual tel- the actual radio show that we're doing. Let's get uh, to and the for top those of you, this. And also for those of you listening uh, in Power Talk Land, you can watch the show on Right to Life of Central California's Facebook page. We have the video right there. Uh, so just go to facebook.com slash right to life CA. It's the word two, T-O, not the number two. Uh, or just search for Right to Life of Central California right there on Facebook. All right. I'm realizing in real time that chugging a Diet Dr. Pepper right before you do radio is a bad idea. Okay. I want to talk about the California Healthy Youth Act. I'm going to point with my thumb like this, like I'm, like I'm a politician, like I'm a Kennedy. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. That's a little bit more of the Bob Dole because you've got like the, the permanent pin holding. Mr. Fred, it's your money. I'm Bob Dole. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about the California Healthy Youth Act. So what is the California Healthy Youth Act, you may ask, and why is it relevant to this show right now? Why aren't you talking about the Democrat debate? Well, another key tenet of this show is we zag when others zig. So everyone's expecting I'm going to talk about the Democratic debate that happened earlier this week, but I'm not going to talk about the California Healthy Youth Act because you can hear bad debate analysis anywhere. Uh, We'll probably talk a little bit about the debate later on. All right. So the California Healthy Youth Act was a law passed by the California legislature in 2015. The California Healthy Youth Act purported to, well, it didn't purport to, it just did. It established the standards whereby sexual education would be governed in public schools in California. Requires certain topics to be taught in certain ages for the sex ed programs throughout the public schools in California. Now, it established all these things in 2015, but as is common with education laws that are establishing curricula guidelines, it it takes a couple of years for things to get fully implemented and for uh, curricula to get into the system. So It's a a lot of work to uh, to turn the 800-ton ship of state that is the California educational system. Yes. With such great results, because our public (laughs) schools are doing so awesome. Anyway, uh, they established a lot of standards whereby sex ed is to be taught in the state. And just this upcoming school year, this upcoming August, they are releasing some of the new curricula that have been adapted for this. And this is something Jonathan Keller, my buddy Jonathan, has been dealing with at California Family Council because lots of it has lots of stuff that lots of people are a little concerned about as it relates to LGBT issues. Yes. But I am here to talk with you about the abortion side of it. So what does the California Healthy Youth Act require? The California Healthy Youth Act requires that any students in grades 7 through 12 be educated about, as the law itself states, all legally acceptable forms of birth control including abortion, including IUDs, including abortifacient contraceptive, uh, abortifacient contraceptive techniques and devices. So uh, the sex ed education is supposed to in- include, here the, the listing that it provides, family life education, AIDS or HIV education, fine, fine, acquisition and or use of birth control devices or drugs, problematic because... A lot of them are not just birth control devices or drugs. They are abortifacient devices or drugs. Abortion itself, gender identity and sexual orientation. Uh, Some of these things could involve the showing of R, NC-17, or X-rated films. So that's great. Uh, Questionnaires, role-playing, and other strategies to examine personal beliefs or practices of the student or the student's family member on sex, family, life, morality, and religion. (laughs) So... There are things in this that are problematic. To put it mildly. To put it mildly. Um, it's also reflective of this, these broader trends in sex ed. So basically, throughout the 20th century, these approach, two d- distinct approaches to sex ed developed. Sexual risk reduction, sexual risk avoidance. Sexual risk avoidance, which is often called abstinence only, and which featured prominently in such movies as... Mean girls. <laughs> Don't ever have sex or, or you'll die. Um, sexual risk avoidance is based off a primary prevention public health model. The idea being if you just say no, 
and do not engage initially with the activity that leads to bad health outcomes, then that is the smartest way from a public health perspective to lessen those bad health outcomes. The greatest example of success in this regard in American history was uh, the various anti-smoking campaigns that took place throughout the 90s and the 2000s. The incidence of teenage smoking dropped drastically. Precipitously. It's, Precipitously. It's down to its lowest point, John. I saw a study, 15%, which is its lowest rate of smoking in 75 years. Yeah. So massive success. Just say no. That's the idea. Sexual risk avoidance is often said, oh, it's not effective, but the numbers are often really skewed and not reflected well. There's actually a good body of evidence showing sexual risk avoidance programs are effective and that kids who engage in sexual risk avoidance are far more likely to delay sexual activity to a healthier age. Um, the big idea between behind sexual risk avoidance is the idea that there are objectively preferable models of living out your sexual life. How dare you, sir? I know. It's, objective it's, it's morality? Objective morality. And it's not even objective morality. Basically, what the people behind SRA are saying is, look, people who delay sexual activity until marriage and restrict their sexual activity to the setting of marriage... In almost every category possible, your economic success, your sexual health, your mental health, your physical health, every single possible category of wellness that you can find, people do better if they restrict their sexual activity to this model. Abstinence before marriage, fidelity during marriage. Okay. The other way of teaching sexual sex ed is what's called sexual risk reduction. So it's not avoiding sexual risk, it's merely reducing it by promoting da, 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 da. contraception, uh, condoms, and as the great backup plan, if contraception fails, abortion. Now, uh, a lot of, it seems like the whole theory behind sexual risk reduction is, well, kids are going to be doing it anyway, which is, the kind of defeatist attitude that you really could have used about cigarette smoking 20 years ago, and people would have said the same thing. Oh, yeah, I guess so. I guess kids really will. Just No. Actually, if you really push sexual risk avoidance, if you really push all of the reasons why this is better for your life, you will find that more and more kids will choose this healthier lifestyle, and it will lead to better sexual and otherwise health outcomes. And John, it's it's funny. If you look at a lot of the ancillary things that were done in the stop smoking campaigns, things like mm -hmm. bans on advertising that gl glamorizes and glorifies tobacco use, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it, it makes one wonder what would happen if those similar types of bans were instituted on uh, positive depictions yeah. of premarital uh, teenage sex in modern media. Right. I mean, that, that would be that would be. <laughs> I'm remarkable. just saying. And it also, uh, sexual risk reduction seems it approaches the issue of sex from basically this model of non-judgmental, non no sense that there's any sort of normative form of sex. So basically, they'll present it. Some people may choose to delay sex until marriage. Other people may choose to wait until they really love someone. And your average 14 year old says, I really love Jenny's boo. Uh, Jenny, <laughs> so much. <laughs> Gosh, my sister in law is named Jenny. She, that, that was a bad example. <laughs> oh, dear God. Anyway, so she's probably going to listen to this too. That's the worst thing. So, Sexual risk avoidance. Oh, my gosh. I've Hard totally pivot. derailed this. Hard pivot. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, sexual risk reduction does not present any form of sex or as normative or as ideal. And in so doing, I think, leads to the situation of teenage sex being very common, which is, by the way, in very many cases, statutory rape and is listed child children having sex is listed, uh, pre, you know, minors having sex is listed by the Centers for Disease Control as a health risk factor along the lines of smoking, along the lines of alcohol use, drug use, etc. It is not healthy. It is not good for children to have sex. So taking, it is also often illegal for children to be having sex because they cannot consent to it 
under the theory of statutory rape. Okay, the idea being that children are not do not have the maturity level to agree to engage in an activity with this sort of moral, physical, spiritual, emotional import. I don't know. I mean, it seems like noted constitutional expert Alan Dershowitz might oh, disagree boy. with you, oh, John. Oh boy. Well, maybe I'll maybe we'll talk a little bit about about Dershy Dershowitz. Uh, we will get into this after the break and talk about what's happening with the California Healthy Youth Act, how you can protect your kids if they're in the public schools from the craziness of the sex ed curricula that are being adopted. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. The best music in the greater Fresno area radio market and possibly the world. Right to Life Radio, joined by Whitney Houston with somebody who loves me. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We are talking about sex ed in the California public schools. I think I want to do more of that. Have a really peppy, high energy song and an immediate hard turn to a really depressing topic. That's a good idea. So there we go. This is this is gonna be this is gonna be our mo. <laughs> Welcome back to Right to Life Radio. We're talking about abortion. Okay, so <laughs> we've been talking about the California Healthy Youth Act. The California Healthy Youth Act was a law passed by the state legislature, signed by the governor in 2015. It regulates how sex ed must be taught, must be taught, must be taught, not may be taught. No exceptions. Not maybe taught in other school districts, but not my kid's school district. Nope. Your kid's public school district. Across the state. All you people in Clovis, this means Clovis Unified, too. Don't act like it's not going to happen there, because it's going to happen there. No, John, but my teacher, I, I know my classroom, will not. If he doesn't, eventually he's going to get in trouble. He slash she. Because <laughs> that's the law. The Fresno Bee already ran a series of articles basically putting every Valley classroom under suspicion for not appropriately teaching like they're gonna crack down on this <laughs> get with the program okay whoa, 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 whoa. okay and we're there all right so what stuff is required to be taught in sex ed classes within the public schools i'll tell you what kinds of things have to be taught kids have to be talk kids have to be taught about abortion they have to be taught about uh, the appropriate, the ability, uh, the, the function of all legally available forms of contraception or birth control, which includes abortion and abortifacient medications and devices, such as the intrauterine device, which is not really a contraceptive. It is an abortifacient. It helps produce abortions. Uh, so, your kids are going to be educated in this, and it's important to understand the context of the state of California's laws regarding kids and their rights regarding reproductive health, okay? So, for most of their health care, parents have to consent before their consent to any treatment for their kids. This is under the theory that kids are minors, they aren't smart enough to make their own health care decisions. They need their parents to do that for them. There are a few instances in California law where there are exceptions to this. One, if you're a minor in the military, you don't need your parents' permission for health care. Two, if you are a minor and you are married, you don't need your parents' permission before you have health care. The third carve-out is anything having to do with reproductive health care. So, this is why, this is why a child, a 12-year-old, in a California public school can get pregnant, they can go to the school nurse, the school nurse can take them during school hours to Planned Parenthood, have her get an abortion at Planned Parenthood, bring her back to the school, mark her as being present for the day so that the school district keeps that money. Falsify records. Falsify records. And never tell the parents a thing. Okay? That can happen. That does happen Every day in schools throughout the Golden State. If kids are being educated about abortion in the sex ed portion of, you know, in as part of sex ed, 
they are going to be taught about their rights as it regards abortion, that they don't need their parents to be notified before they have an abortion, that they don't need their parents' consent before abortion. That is what is being educated. That is what your kids are going to learn about. Yes. And guess who's going to teach many portions of the sex ed curriculum in the public schools in Fresno Unified, well, Josh, in the public schools in Los Angeles Unified. Sh- sh- surely not Planned Parenthood, because that would seem to be an obvious conflict of interest, because they, like, I mean, number one, they'd get the contract from the government to teach it, but then they'd also have the contract to provide those services either on campus or off campus, and then they'd also have the reimbursements from Medicare to provide the abortions. Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal. Yeah, I mean, surely not Planned Parenthood, because that'd be like a three-way conflict of interest. I got bad news for you. It's Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood is used by Fresno Unified as a vendor for teaching sex ed to your kids. It's used as a vendor for Los Angeles Unified to teach sex ed to your kids. I believe, I'm not sure about this, but I believe they're also used by Central Unified. So, not great. It is not good. Planned Parenthood basically has this sweetheart deal where they get to advertise all their services to kids. They get to... Advertise all their services in the classroom to kids. Kids know where to go for contraception, etc. When things fail, when the ultimate backup solution of abortion is needed, they know exactly where to go because Planned Parenthood's been in their classroom, told them who they are, where they are, where to go, what their rights are, etc. So it's really bad. How can you fight back? How can you keep your kids out of this? We'll talk about that right after the break. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. This is Head Honcho. This is by the band Gown. I don't know anything about them, (laughs) but they're a hair metal band. Wow. This is their song called Head Honcho. You're listening to Right to Life Radio on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. I'm I'm assuming, I'm just divining from the... the image that is on the screen that is playing this, that this this might be from the soundtrack of that epic work of cinema, Hot Rod? Yes. Yes, it is. The soundtrack to Hot Rod is awesome, which is a movie starring Andy Samberg uh, from the mid-2000s. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. My wife hates it. So you know <laughs> it, you know that I must uh, find it uh, bizarrely and asininely funny. Right to Life Radio. Right here on Power Talk 96.7 and AM 1400. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Okie doke. We've been talking about the California Healthy Youth Act. This is the law that was passed in California in 2015 being implemented now about the requirements for sex ed within the public schools. And we were talking about all of the bad abortion-related stuff in it. Now, it's not within sort of the purview of rights of life, but Jonathan... You work for California Family Council. I, I do, as a matter what of fact. What are some of the other... Just very quickly, we're not we're not going to dwell on it too much because, uh, frankly, the FCC might take us off the air. <laughs> but what are some of the other things that are in these new curricula that are being adopted right now as regards sex ed? In uh, certain, right. in, Depending on which school district well, you're talking to. G- given the fact that this is a, a family show, I will I will try to be discreet, but I will just put it this way. There, there are many things that were discussed uh, in the framework. It's se- over 700 pages long. And, and some the framework of, was sort of de- detailing the kinds of things that should be in the right. curricula, these a- different curricula. After the Healthy Youth Act was passed, like John mentioned in the first segment, they it took a while to get everything implemented. And you had to have all these bureaucrats write all these things. And this is, we're interpreting what the legislature means. Because, of course, the legislature... Can't just pa- tell you what it no, means. No. Th- they passed something very vague and innocuous sounding. Because otherwise, their voters could actually hold them accountable on, hey, you voted for this bill that says um, teens should be taught about all sorts of, um, how do I put this politely? Interesting sexual positions? Non-reproductive sexual activities. Ah. And and I believe the the old-fashioned term for that was sodomy. (laughs) That's one (laughs) word. Back in the day. Okay. Uh That's one. Um, And other other types of things, um, there are certain activities that, people engage in i guess that in, involve um bodily fluids uh we'll all right put, put it that way yeah. um that do so, not have uh, a, i believe the president was accused yeah, of that in some, the in the steel memo that, which, yes, which was that, never substantiated that's uh, right ever but was but pretty gross th- there's there's all sorts of things that um 
have no direct bearing on reproduction, <laughs> but that apparently <laughs> teens need to learn about and within the context of some of these curricula. Correct. Okay. And, and, and so that's yeah, that's the uh, being as vague as possible. Let your don't let your emotion go too or your, your imagination go too far. I would say. All right. Let it so, wander, but uh, don't, don't do that. So definitely something that uh, your 12-year-old uh, with pigtails in the seventh grade definitely does not need to hear about. Okay. So the question becomes, what are the rights of parents as regards sex ed within the public schools? What are par parents' rights? So I have uh, some resources that we received from the California Catholic Conference and thank them for, for doing this. This is actually a really helpful thing, and I hope they will push this throughout Catholic churches throughout the state of California because it's really only a very small percentage of Catholic kids are going to Catholic schools. The vast majority of them are in public schools. So this is stuff we need to know about. So uh, in grades one through 12, a school may not administer. Uh, okay. Uh, let, let's get to the opt out part. So can you opt your kid out of sex ed? A parent or guardian of a pupil in grades seven through 12 has the right to excuse their child from all or any part of comprehensive sexual health education, HIV prevention education, and assessments related to that education. Prior to exercising this option, parents or guardians also have the right to be notified about the planned instruction and the right to review those materials in, in advance of the instruction taking place. If a school district elects to provide sexual health education below grade 7, it should be age-appropriate and parental rights designated for grades 7 through 12 are in effect. Okay, so effectively what this saying this is saying is that you have the full right to opt your kid out. Now, the difficulty is that the, the default status for your kid is that your kid is opted in to everything. The default status is that, okay, well, you have the right to examine this stuff if you ask for it, but you got to ask for it, okay? Um, so th this is kind of the sneaky, and I think, I think frankly... I mean, this is not a show about what are the rights of parents, I guess, but I'm going to venture some opinions of my own. I, I think this really sort of intrudes upon the rights of parents. Uh, I think a more traditional, maybe I'll, I'll say a Catholic understanding anyway, I being a Catholic, this is the tradition I'm coming out of, of education is that parents are the primary educators of their children. That is the, wait, wait, the wait. primary goal. The pr that is the parents are the ones with the primary responsibility for educating their kids. H hold on, John. I... I was informed on MSNBC by <laughs> by Melissa Harris Perry that children quote and this is one of my favorite quotes from an MSNBC anchor from one of the promos <laughs> she did. Children are the only thing that belong to all of us. Well, not Madeline or Sophia or John Peter Girardi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no, children do not belong to the state. They don't belong to the whole community. But it takes a village. That's what. That's what. In a Madam, certain, Madam Hillary Rodham Clinton told in us. In a certain sense, but not in the sense that she meant it. Kami Pinko. Anyway, uh, no. My kid belongs to me, and my kid's education is my responsibility. Mine, 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 mine. Until at such point as you can determine justly that I'm engaging in child abuse, my child belongs to me. Okay? As long as I'm not abusing my child or hurting my child, whatever. My kid belongs to me. I direct my child's education. Not the state, nobody else. If I let my kid go to a public school, it's because I am delegating my authority as, an as the educator and raiser of my kid. It, in the broader sense of the word education, which had, I think, a much larger sense in America prior to, I don't know, the 1970s or so, the broader definition of education is not just academic learning in about academic subjects it was the entirety of the development of the person in the integral development of the person which includes stuff like morality and ethics and religion and the whole way in which your child is raised it, it's not just you know can you do as multiplication tables um so i would highly encourage any parents out there listening if your kids in a public school you should either really closely examine what the sex ed curriculum is that is being taught to your kid. And if you determine that that does not line up with your pro-life values, and by the way, it won't. <laughs> by According to state law, it should not. It's not. It's designed not to. Uh, 
pull your kid out of sex ed. And I guarantee you, teachers will make you feel bad. Other kids will tease your kid. Administrators will give you a hard time. There will be hoops you will have to jump through. But you know what? Tough word I can't say on, on radio, do the FCC. Tough, tough bleep. Cookies. Tough bleep. Okay? Pull your kid out of it. All right, do you love your kid? Do you love your kid? Do you love your kid enough to tell him, no, you're not going to be in that stupid sex ed thing? Do you love your kid enough to be that one pain in the neck parent? Love your kid enough to be the pain in the neck parent, okay? Yank your kid out of sex ed in the public schools in California. Get them out. If, and this is, this is, a lot of this stuff is applying to charter schools also. Okay, so don't don't think just because you're in a charter school that you're totally exempt from this. You you may you very well may not be. But love your kid enough to exempt them from this stuff. This stuff is bad. It is coming from a state legislature, a governor, a California teachers union, a California Department of Education, which is all staffed by people who fundamentally do not agree with you on foundational moral beliefs about life they want to get your kids away from you to give them their moral beliefs not yours to replace your beliefs with theirs to supplant your moral authority with theirs all right we have zagged sufficiently jonathan we're going to talk about the debate in the next segment zig for the win you're listening to right to life radio on power talk 96.7 and am 1400 This is, I believe his name is Dobie Gray. This is Drift Away. Crank it, Raphael. Right to Life Radio. Thank you all so much for tuning in. All right. With, the, with those positive psychic vibes being delivered to the radio show, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Democratic debate. Now, uh, for those of you, uh, just to peel back the curtain, this is a pre-recorded show. I apologize. We're recording this on Thursday. We just saw night one of the debate where Marianne Williamson dominated the Democratic stage. Um, now, abortion was not really a key topic in this uh, in today's debate, not a topic at all, John. Not really. Com- completely ignored, much to the chagrin of NARAL and Planned Parenthood and all the other folks. Yeah, so they they were upset that that abortion didn't get more time. Well, to be fair, um, abortion's number one cheerleader, Kirsten Gillibrand, was mm-hmm. not on the stage on Tuesday night. She was on the Wednesday night stage. So the coverage, as you've said, w- is primarily focusing on the Tuesday night. Maybe maybe they are going to go all abortion all the time on Wednesday night. Maybe that is the the good news. But yes. the the debate on Tuesday night, yeah, they uh, they spent a lot of time, a whole heck of a lot of time on health care. Yes, and that is important. So uh, one of the key questions that are, that's going to be presented throughout this. Uh, upcoming presidential campaign is the question of Medicare for all. Um, I don't think Bernie Sand. Uh, I don't think. Excuse me. I don't think Joe Biden has endorsed Medicare for all. No. But he's one of very few Democrat candidates uh, who has not. And if Medicare for all becomes kind of the standard for the Democrat Party going forward in 2020. Uh, this is a really big deal for the sake of abortion policy. Now, I've talked about this a lot when we talk about insurance and government program, government health care programs. We at Right to Life Central California, we don't really take a position necessarily on the question of whether or not the government should pay for everyone to have health insurance. Um, they're very smart people and very decent people on both sides of that question. It's This is not a show about insurance. 
I always, I, I always get make, made fun of by my family when I declare what this show is not about. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, are the, you are the Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy of your own show. Yeah. Damn it, Jim. <laughs> I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. I'm an I'm a abortion policy talker, not a... Not a <laughs> anyway, that's me. I remember one time I had a show where I said, this isn't a water show. And my daughters, <laughs> Maddie and Sophie, thought, who are four and two, thought that was the most hilarious thing I'd ever said. So I got home, they're like, this isn't a water show, daddy, <laughs> etc. So this is not a show about insurance policy. Uh, there are very decent people on both sides of the question of whether the government should pay for everyone's health insurance. I would say, though, from the perspective of Right to Life of Central California, there are two points to consider. One is that any government-funded insurance plan should not pay for abortion. It should not pay for physician-assisted suicide. It should not pay for abortifacient contraception. I don't believe any of those things are, quote, health care. None of those things are health care. Okay? Uh, it should therefore be excluded from health insurance. Health care involves correcting something that is wrong with the human body, something that is in the human body that is not functioning appropriately, whether due to disease or injury or what have you. Pregnancy, pregnancy is not a disease. Right. Pregnancy is words. not a disease. It is not a health condition to be corrected. It is a natural biological process. Uh, abortion is not a healthcare procedure. It is just the ending of human life. So I don't think that any, and it's, it's also grievously immoral in addition to not being healthcare. So no government funded health insurance program should pay for abortion, period. The other question, the, the other issue where I, I, I think right to life can have legitimate concern, and it's kind of a who watches the watchers problem that, that, that may be beyond, frankly, it, 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 would, it would militate against any system of government-run health care in a sense. Uh, who runs the system of government-run health care? There's, there's also this practical reality that um, if you have universal health care, and everyone's paid with a single, you know, it's a single payer model, something equivalent to what they have in Great Britain, say. Um, not everyone's getting a Cadillac. Okay. Healthcare is a limited resource, it is a limited commodity. Not everyone is getting a Cadillac. Maybe everyone could get a Honda Accord. Honda Accords are pretty nice, but they're not Cadillacs. Okay. Uh, and there's a certain degree of healthcare rationing that has to take place within within a system like this with a single payer. John, you would have access to a Honda Accord, but it wouldn't be your Honda Accord. Well, that's the other thing. You, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You'd be on a waiting list. You to may use be on a waiting Honda list. Accord. Yes, yes, yes. Now, and and in certain countries that works better than others. Uh, in Iceland, a country whose population is less than that of Fresno, uh, often it works really well. In Great Britain, uh, not not so well. So. You have you you have to have they there is a certain kind of rationing that takes place within healthcare and I think even in the United Kingdom there there's certain like kind of hard lines that they draw like nobody over the age of seventy four uh, uh, over the age of seventy you know whatever is allowed to get this kind of heart surgery okay even if you have the money to do, like like the your government funded insurance is not going to pay for just because for this kind of heart surgery. After this age, just based on these, you know, actuarial tables that just say this is just not worth it and we're not going to fund this. OK, and those are the kinds of things that have to happen if you're going to have universal government run health care. The people, though, who make decisions about who gets and doesn't receive certain kinds of health care, what is the moral compass that guides them? We've seen in the United Kingdom over the last several years, a couple of infants with serious autoimmune diseases who were deprived of food and drink, nutrition and hydration, basic care, and allowed to starve and or dehydrate to death, not because treatment couldn't be given to them, but because doctors and then judges, to whom these cases were appealed, determined that the child's likely quality of life was not going to be sufficient. But John, I was reliably informed that the state... I'm using quality of life in scare quotes, by the way. I, I was reliably informed that the state doesn't take a position on these issues. They just exist to protect the rights of the little guy or little girl 
And, well, you know, I, I, I clearly I, not. I thought that there was not supposed to be morality in government, but you just need these technocratic rules that provide opportunities to people. Problem is that when the rubber meets the road, that's not really true. Eventually, you need to have a decision be made who is acting. It is the decision by a parent of a child who has a critical illness is keeping that child alive, uh, child abuse. And that's effectively what the courts in the United Kingdom said about Alfie Evans and Charlie Gard, both little boys who had serious autoimmune diseases. Um, their parents wanted to give them alternative forms of treatment, and the United Kingdom said no. Uh, this child's quality of life, expected quality of life, is such that by you trying to give them more treatment, you're engaged in child abuse, and we're going to take, we're we're going to refuse to provide this child with any further treatment, which was a gross infringement on those rights. So, who makes these decisions is a really, really important consideration when you're talking about, you know. You know, doctors are not plumbers, okay? The decisions they make can be deeply moral, deeply moral or deeply immoral. They're dealing with issues of morality. They're not just, they're dealing with human lives. They're not just, you know, fixing your plumbing, okay? If you pay a plumber to plumb your pipes terribly, he'll do it. He'll think you're an idiot, but he's not committing any mortal sins, okay? In medicine, this is something different. So... This is the cautionary tale for having a massive government-funded uh, healthcare system that pays for everybody who makes the decisions. All right. Well, folks, with that, we're going to sign off. We have Bobby Darren sing singing us out for the old Italian man part of the show. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and we will see you next week on Right to Life Radio.